Las Vegas, the city of sin, the place I lost $80 on penny slots. Earlier this year, F1 announced that in 2023, F1 cars will be racing under the lights on the strip. At first, this seems like an awesome idea. For all its faults and debauchery, Vegas is one of America's favorite cities. But if Vegas is so great for racing, why was this idea a flop when F1 tried it 40 years ago? What do we lose by adding another North American race to the calendar? And why does F1 keep traveling to street circuits and not purpose-built racetracks? What's the real cost of racing in Las Vegas? Saddle up, set your spurs on down. Donuts made the sickest hat in town. License real tree, camo on your head. Yeah, that's what I said. Sing it. C A M O H A T. Baddest hat that you can't see. C A M O H A T. Made for you and me. So now you can represent your favorite automotive brand when you're on the road on the lake or up in that blind only available at donutmedia.com get you one whether you're fixing cars or in the woods donuts got you looking good in your c-a-m-o-h-a-t blend in and stand out in donut country Let's first address the elephant in the room. The original Las Vegas F1 circuit at Caesars Palace was one of the worst tracks in F1 history. In 1981, F1 introduced the Caesars Palace Grand Prix. No, not the American Grand Prix or the Las Vegas Grand Prix. Caesars Palace Grand Prix was the official name. If that doesn't already sound like an obvious cash grab, just wait. The course was a, let's say, uninspired layout in a parking lot that looked more like an autocross than the most expensive motor racing series in the world. The flat track had some decent overtaking zones, but didn't really fit the spectacle that the sport was known for. Even though the race was run in October, the Nevada desert was still the Nevada desert, one of the hottest places in the world. The underprepared asphalt of the parking lot track made for some unbearable temperatures for both cars and drivers. Brabham driver Nelson Piquet notably suffered from heat stroke through the weekend and so many other drivers and cars were affected by the heat that only half of the 24 qualifiers finished the race that's an insane amount of attrition the exposed nature of the track also meant that desert winds would blow sand all over the course seriously affecting grip in certain areas 1982 was even worse with air temperatures reaching 100 degrees of the 36 cars that were flown out to vegas only 12 finished the race sounds pretty bad right who the heck would want to try this again well luckily for 2023 not all these problems still exist and F1's new Las Vegas proposal seems to fix a lot of the others. While sand on the track was a really big deal in the 80s, it's something that F1 teams are more used to dealing with now. Races like the Bahrain Grand Prix have similar issues, and it can make for some really great racing. Also, Las Vegas doesn't look like it did in the 80s, when the casinos used to literally butt up against the desert. The city is now surrounded by a lot more infrastructure. And this time around, the track isn't a parking lot parade. The new proposed layout will wind its way around the city, with the main straight being the Las Vegas Strip itself. You wanted a spectacle? You got it! F1 cars will be screaming down the strip at night under the lights of all the casinos, and the fact that it's a night race also fixes the heat issue. So it's a win-win-win, right? Well, I'm not 100% convinced. A street circuit comes with a lot of compromises. It's definitely cheaper than building a brand new facility like the Circuit of the Americas, and we've seen other street circuits like Baku, Jeddah, and Miami serve as ways to get F1 to new places without having to build a track. Everything needs to be built up quickly and torn down just as fast when the event is over, and the biggest conceit of a street circuit is that it needs to fit on the streets themselves. Las Vegas, like most US cities, is built on a grid system. Most existing corners are 90 degree left or 90 degree right. Combine that with the fact that Las Vegas has pretty much no elevation change and circuit designers have had to get a little creative to make this work. You can already see the compromises that need to be made. For instance, the Las Vegas Strip might be the centerpiece of the event, but surprisingly, it's not the start finish straight. That's out here. This little stretch is about 325 meters, or to put that in perspective, 150 meters shorter than the straight at Monaco. They need 160 meters just to fit all the cars on the grid. So we're talking about a rundown to turn one that is 165 meters max. Pole sitter Kevin Magnuson will barely have gotten up to speed by turn one. The point is that F1 doesn't always fit neatly into a given city. F1 has to be very choosy about which cities play host to street circuits, and I think that they might have screwed up a little bit with Vegas. Because if you look at all other cities that host F1 on their streets, you'll see that they have one thing that Las Vegas does not. 
water. The street circuits in Monaco, Miami, Jeddah, Baku, Singapore, and Valencia are all coastal. And it's not just for seaside views. There's a practical reason not to have a street circuit that's landlocked. Let's look at the closest street circuit to the donut offices, Long Beach. It's used for IndyCar, F1 used to run there as well, and it runs along these port side roads of the city. For one thing, these roads are sweeping and curvy because they were built to follow the water's edge. No straight line grid system here. But one other thing you notice is that these roads aren't the main roads of the city. Not many people need these roads to work or commute or to run their business. Long Beach has a much easier time shutting down these roads to let IndyCar race on them. A few years ago, I went to the NYC E-Pre for Formula E, and it isn't in New York. It's in an old shipping area of Brooklyn called Red Hook. Not exactly a tourist hub. But in Las Vegas, F1 wants to run down the main road, the world-famous Las Vegas Strip. Can you imagine how many people's daily commutes are going to be affected by this track? I mean, in a town like Monaco, you know what you're in for. The Grand Prix there is just as famous as the town itself. And Monaco is the exception to most F1 rules anyway. But Vegas doesn't really care about F1. Vegas is famous for not caring about any event that comes to it. During a large event like the Consumer Electronics Show, if you're only a few city blocks away, you could have no idea it's even taking place. And now you want this city to shut down half its roads for a race that doesn't even feature an American driver? Sounds like a hard sell for the residents. But despite the inconvenience to locals, I think most residents will enjoy a race in Vegas. And if they don't, let's be honest, they're gonna have very little say in the matter anyway. But you know who probably does have a lot of say? The casinos. The Las Vegas Strip is home to over 30 major hotels and casinos, all of which will be massively impacted by a bunch of race cars blocking their driveways. Now, I have no idea how exactly the deal between Liberty Media and the city of Las Vegas is supposed to work, but I'm guessing that the casinos are definitely involved. 18 of the casinos on the Strip are owned by just two companies, MGM Resorts and Caesars Entertainment. But in Vegas, one company might own and operate the casino business while a totally separate company owns the real estate. Companies like VC, Dreamscape, and Blackstone own most of the actual facilities and buildings relating to the casinos you know. Jeez, 2022, man, even the casinos have to pay rent instead of owning property. It's rough out there. But what this means is that F1 and Liberty Media have dozens of big stakeholders that they need to appease to get the Las Vegas F1 race off the ground. The casinos stand to make a lot of money from the influx of wealthy tourists coming into town. And if they feel like something about the proposed plan favors a competitor instead of them, they're gonna raise a stink about it. I guarantee on race weekend, some casino is gonna try and get a grandstand lowered or something because it blocks the view from their sold out VIP pool deck. It's gonna happen. So F1 is gonna have to build a brand new track, make it fit in a city that isn't well suited for it and appease about a dozen huge companies that all want to make more money than the other. And while I don't doubt that F1 can do it, I gotta ask, what does this cost? And I don't mean how much money does this cost. I mean, what do we lose for this to happen? With Formula One's rising popularity, parent company Liberty Media has been adding more and more races to the calendar every year, while at the same time introducing a yearly cost cap to the sport and lowering the allocation of parts that a team can have in a year without incurring penalties. Drivers, team bosses, and engineers have been vocal about the stress of this new schedule, and because of all that, I don't think we're going to be adding an extra weekend to the F1 calendar next year. So that means to add Las Vegas, we have to lose a track, right? No problem. What about the hotly contested Jetta Corniche Circuit, a track that many drivers call too dangerous to race on and many fans object to either on the basis of Saudi Arabia's human rights policies or the likelihood of oil refinery bombings during the weekend? <sighs> Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Jetta has a contract with F1 until 2025. Many other tracks have multi-year contracts as well. In fact, the only current tracks that don't have agreements to host F1 next year are Monaco, the Red Bull Ring, Paul Ricard in France, Spa, and Mexico. So, which one do we lose? Monaco is pretty famous for having the least passing of any race during the season, and they have some weird rules they have grandfathered in, like having their own TV crew for the weekend. But Monaco is also synonymous with the sport. Maybe it's most famous race, and drivers still love the challenge of it. The Paul Ricard circuit has been criticized for generating boring events in the past as well, but last year's race was great, and with the new cars being able to follow closely, this track is poised for a really good battle in 2022. Plus, we got two French drivers and a French team on the grid, so we can kinda need a French Grand Prix. I doubt we lose the Red Bull ring because Red Bull has their own team and wouldn't wanna lose the chance to race at their home track. So that leaves Mexico, a great track with a wonderful crowd, and Spa, one of the most legendary circuits on the calendar. Which of these venues is gonna get cut? I don't envy the people that have to make this decision because I don't think there's any winning here unless they just add Las Vegas as an extra race. 
I've got praises and criticisms for each of these at-risk tracks, but what I don't wanna see is for F1 to cut the one with the least money. But if they don't cut a race, then team budgets and parts allocations will be spread even thinner than they already are. What that means is that with the rising demand for more races, we could see a future where F1 chooses to race at more street courses over tracks with longer histories in the sport. And as much as I'd love to have a race that I can literally drive to, I don't want it if it means losing the tracks that help get me into the sport in the first place. Thank you very much for watching. What do you guys think? Which track would you want to see cut for Las Vegas? What do you think about hosting a race in Las Vegas? Are you going to go? Uh, tickets are probably going to be pretty expensive. Go ahead and hit that like button and that subscribe button if you haven't already. It really helps us out. And if you're a donut super freak, hit that join button. Join the Donut Underground. You get access to an exclusive Discord as well as behind the scenes content that normal subscribers do not get access to. Follow Donut Media on all social media at Donut Media and follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. Be kind. I'll see you next time.